Okay, this um, is a continuation of a lecture that whose uh, recording was interrupted halfway through. So I'm just finishing up the lecture here so that anyone who missed a lecture can um, see the video. We were talking about context switches and how they're handled by the XB6 operating system. And this was the little bit of code that we were analyzing. So there was, we were imagining there's some C code in a user program that runs this kill um, function, which is actually a system call, and it passes one parameter, 43, and this is telling the OS to send a kill signal to process number 43. And this ends up compiling to uh, the first two instructions shown here, the push and the call, are just a simple um, C calling convention. So this happens, this kind of thing would happen for any um, C function, right? So you push the argument onto the stack and then you run the call command to jump to the label called kill, which is the name of the function. And then the function itself is implemented down here. But th what's interesting is that the implementation of this kill system call from the user's perspective uh, is very short. All it really does is it, it moves a number eight into the EAX register. So eight is a special number that is the system call number for kill. So somewhere in the code that I showed already, um, there's a constant sys underscore kill that's, that's defined as eight. And then after that is stored in the register, it uses the uh, int instruction, which stands for interrupt, uh, to trigger a software interrupt number 64. And 64 is another special number, which is was chosen by XV6 for system calls. So every system call is going to call int 64. And then once that's done, this um, function returns and execution resumes in the user program after this uh, kill function was invoked. Okay, so let's, let's, there's a lot that, ha that goes on in this one little interrupt instruction, and um, let's try to figure out what, what happens. So the most important thing that happens with that int command is um, that the CPU switches to privileged mode and at the same time, it also starts executing elsewhere. So it looks in the interrupt vector table for the 64th entry, because 64 was the number passed in, and that's gonna to point to a specific function that's, that's used to handle interrupt 64, which is uh, software interrupts, well, it's system calls. And then in the definition of that function, um, in XV6 in particular, the definition of that system call handler is going to check the EAX register to find you know, which system call we want to run. In this case, it's going to find the number 8 there, and it will use uh, that to figure out which function to call next. In this case, it's going to be the sys underscore kill function, which is a, you know, defined in the kernel to handle system calls. And it's not going to get any parameters, because at this point, um, nothing nothing's been passed in as far as the kernel functions are concerned. But um, back in here, in syscall.c, there's this table of, it's, it's an array of uh, pointers to functions that's defined that lists all the system calls according to their system call number. So number eight down here, syskill, is, uh, stores a pointer to the syskill function. And that's how uh, the OS will know what code to run to handle uh, the uh, kill system call. Now, one tricky part about this is how the kernel gets the parameter left by the user, because the kernel has its own stack, and the user has the user uh, user mode has its own stack, and kernel mode has its own stack. So, what the the code inside of um, this kill has to use some special functions in XV6 to dig into the user stack to get the parameters that were left there and copy them over into um, the kernel code and, uh, and use them. All right, and then at that point, uh, the syskill implementation will you know, implement the logic of kill with using the parameters that it got. And when it's done, it uses the iret instruction, which stands for interrupt return, to um, switch back to user mode and resume execution of the user process and also to return an integer value to it. And so this picture kind of shows what what can happen with um, interrupts 
but both software interrupts and hardware interrupts. So you have a process that runs for a while. So process A, time is uh, proceeding downward. Process A is running. Eventually it calls the read system call. And that triggers a software interrupt that causes the kernel to run. And um, the, kernel, uh, the kernel code runs briefly and it may decide to actually schedule a different process to run next. In this case, it does that because the uh, read system call requires um, a disk operation, an I.O., and it won't be able to return until that disk is done working, so process A is actually blocked or sleeping at that point, so it's not even possible to schedule process A to run again. So process B um, is actually, the kernel decides to run process B, and doing that requires what's called a context switch. And that's basically where you copy the, um, you take the in-memory state, or the in the CPU state of process A that was previously running, and you store it somewhere in, in process A's memory. You know, in, actually in a kernel memory for process A, somewhere for safekeeping. And then you look at process B, and you find the last CPU state that it had in its kernel memory, and you copy that into the CPU to set it up so that it can run. It's called context switch. Um, in this particular example, um, like I said, process A runs, it calls read, then the kernel runs for a little bit of time to set up a switch to process B, after, of course, the kernel sets up the disk read, um, but the disk read happens in the background. Um, and then process B runs for a while, and at some point process B is actually interrupted. What process B, B, process B doesn't call a system call to, to get interrupted, but actually the disk is done with its read, so it calls, it, it triggers a hardware interrupt, which the kernel responds to in the same way that, a very similar way to what I just showed you before for the uh, software interrupts. So the kernel will run a specific function that's designed to handle uh, disk interrupts. And in, in handling that, it'll realize that process A was the process waiting for that data. So the kernel at that point may decide to do a context switch to switch back to process A so that process A can continue running after the read call because the read call is now finished. So there's a special type of um, hardware and interrupt called the timer interrupt which is very useful for the OS. This is one of those hardware features that really lets uh, the OS um, uh, work. Without a timer interrupt, it would be hard to design a, a, a proper OS. So what it does is, it's actually just a simple piece of hardware that generates an interrupt periodically, and it's programmable. So maybe every one or every 10 milliseconds, it'll trigger an interrupt. And what that does is it, you know, interrupts whatever's running and causes the kernel run to handle that interrupt. Now there's not really much to do to handle that interrupt because the interrupt was, it, it wasn't important in any sense, it wasn't signaling anything that needed to happen, but basically what it does is it periodically gives the kernel an opportunity to act and to do whatever it might need to do periodically. So um, for example, I mean really the main reason this is important is if you have a user process that never call system calls, or if it gets stuck in an infinite loop where it never does any I.O. or anything uh, like that, then the kernel in that case would never get an opportunity to act. So the kernel, kernel would not have an opportunity to, for example, to schedule a different process. Um, but the timer interrupt makes sure the kernel can run at least you know once every 10 milliseconds or once every 100 milliseconds, whatever time you decide to program it with. Um, you can in the kernel code that handles that interrupt, you can, you know, implement whatever policy needs to uh, be implemented. And specifically, you can implement a scheduling policy uh, to give another process a chance to run. Okay. So, um, so far we've shown how each process gets its own copy of CPU registers and ha kind of has the illusion that it uses the CPU all by itself. And you know, the software interrupts allow the kernel to take over and do things that uh, the user is not allowed to do. 
but we we we've only talked about um, CPU registers so far. We've shown how with a context switch you copy the CPU registers from that one process to memory and allow another process to start using those registers. Um, but registers are only a small part of the storage that uh, programs use. Registers are really quite small. So process processes also need to use memory and we also want to give them the illusion that they have all the memory to themselves. This is very convenient. Um, and that's called virtual memory. So what's shown on the left is a, a, a a diagram showing you know the full full memory space that a process thinks it has and it can be programmed such that it uses all the memory in, in the system but in reality um, what virtual memory does is it it maps virtual memory to physical memory so in reality we have a certain amount of limited physical memory and that memory is shared by different processes um, and so at a given time you know, process one may have this large blue uh, virtual memory space, and certain chunks of it are mapped to different regions of physical memory. But then other parts of physical memory are not used by that process. Uh, they're used by another process. And s certain parts of virtual memory, if they can't fit in physical memory because of the demands of all the different processes running, you can actually store those parts of memory on disk. And that's called swapping. So uh, virtual memory is a complex topic that we'll talk about uh, a few lectures later, uh, near the, you know, the middle part of the quarter. But I just want to introduce that because um, to give you a preview of like all the, all the components that go into um, isolating processes. So virtual memory is a very important uh, mechanism to isolate processes because it essentially dedicates different parts of the physical memory to different processes and it ensures that processes can only access the parts of memory that have been assigned uh, to, to their, for their use and they cannot access um, other processes memory.